නිවසේ මෙවැනි මතුපිට රැඳෙන 20 බීජ 99.9ක්ම විනාශ කරන Vim Cleaners Tonight, startling stats with the Delta variant accounting for a shocking 75% of daily cases. Health experts reveal what to do in case of symptoms. If you have a fever with no other cause, consider it's either COVID or dengue. If you are checked positive, consider the whole household as positive for COVID. Double disaster. The opposition accuses the government of failing to maintain law and order, citing police detentions of university student union members. There's no rule of law in this country. I don't know why we even have a minister called a public security minister. Honorable uh, Sumandran is talking nonsense. You have the brass to call my speech uh, nonsense. Who are you? Absolute havoc you are wreaking in the country. Follow the rules. The government decides to tighten restrictions on public gatherings in new efforts to close the door on rising COVID cases. Careful investments. The US ambassador explains why American firms may be wary of port city partnerships. So US investors, you know, writ large, are interested in Sri Lanka. They have to know also that they're not going to be exposed or collaborating with entities that could have economic measures levied against them. All this and much more coming up on this Friday, the 6th of August 2021. Pocket ticket to fit win a new Axe ticket perfume. From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana first at 9. Live from Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I am Shanella Fernando in your top stories for tonight. After weeks of speculation of a rapid spread of the dreaded Delta variant in the country, it has been confirmed that the Delta variant is now on its way to becoming the dominant strain. This was highlighted by Dr. Chandima Jeevandara of the University of Sri Jayawardenepura on social media today when he revealed the results of random sequencing of PCR test samples that has revealed a staggering 75% positive rate for the Delta variant. Physicians are are now urging people to be aware of the slightest signs of symptoms and have requested that they seek immediate treatment. Many health experts say that the Delta variant of COVID-19 is fast becoming the dominant strain in the country. With that, they add that the Delta variant infected patients now account for 20% to 30% of overall cases reported each day. Random gene sequencing tests carried out on PCR samples have lent some credibility to these claims, with 117 having come back with positive for the highly infectious variant. According to Dr. Hemant Herat at the Ministry of Health, these statistics could mean that there are more Delta variant patients in society than previously assumed. Further, immunology researcher Dr. Chandima Jeevandar of the Sri Jayawardenepura University revealed a startling fact on social media today that 75% of COVID cases confirmed last week in Colombo were infected with the Delta variant. He added that in the first week of July, this figure stood at just 19.3%. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's daily COVID-19 figure stood at over 2,000 once again yesterday with 2,662 cases confirmed across the country. Of this number, 1,089 infections were recorded from the Western Province alone. As such, the burden on majority of hospitals in Sri Lanka has risen steadily over the past few days. However, the Health Ministry's Dr. Hemantaherat says that hospitals have not exceeded their full capacities just yet. Almost all these hospitals are having this type of disaster or emergency programs and based on the agreements that they have come in preparing these plans, they can declare it and then mobilize the resources to a specific activity where the large number of admissions are coming. The issue is sometimes when these type of things are happening, there are so many other things that we need to take into consideration, especially if it is a sudden onset activity, you cannot think, you have to immediately action. But this is something where we have not overflown the capacity. But when the capacity is increasing and we know that in future this is going to happen, we'll have to take into 
consideration that there are other services that will be compromising. So to prevent that, we have to do it in a careful, planned manner. But all these hospitals are having these plans. To my knowledge, all these places, they have done their best to accommodate the patients. With that, Minister of Health Pavitra Vanyarachi says that integrated home care for COVID patients would begin from Monday, the 9th of August, in a move to reduce the pressure on already strained hospital capacities. Meanwhile, with COVID case numbers and deaths on the rise, consultant physician at the Colombo National Hospital, Dr. Upul Disanayaka, urged anyone who displays symptoms such as fever or respiratory issues to assume that it may be either COVID-19 or dengue and seek immediate treatment. At the moment, if you have a respiratory illness in the community, you have to consider it as COVID. And if you have a fever with no other cause, consider it either COVID or dengue. Even if you are not positive, as checked, consider this two possibilities. If you are checked positive, consider the whole household as positive of COVID. Because according to the spread that we see, if somebody in a household is positive, the others are considered positive, whether you have a positive report or not. So stay in bed, don't exert, take adequate amount of liquids, around 2,500 milliliters of water and other liquids. Mainly, I have a special message to the mothers. Now, when a man in the house is sick, he stays in bed. But when a mother is sick, she has to look after all the needs of the family, including cooking, cleaning, and doing all the household work. Don't do that until you get better for 14 days because it is very important that you take rest because in COVID you die because of lack of oxygen and you can't do anything about the lung they are not absorbing enough oxygen but you can do a lot of things to stop your oxygen being used. In the meantime, health officials have also urged expectant mothers to avoid venturing out of their homes as case numbers are on the rise among some of the highest risk groups at the moment. In the meantime, as for today, 1,910 novel coronavirus infections were confirmed across the country. Further, recoveries also increased today as well by 1,942 to bring the overall number to 288,307. With the country's daily COVID-19 infections continuously surpassing 2,000, head of the National Operations Center for the Prevention of COVID-19, Army Commander General Shavindra Silva announced a tightening of restrictions on public gatherings. As such, the number of persons able to attend weddings and other functions from today has been limited to 150, while funeral attendees were limited to 25. Danata Sri Lanka Tula Pavatina Kuitatwe Salakil at again, a Visheshem Vivaha Mangal Saha Anikut Utsava Sandha Labadi Tubu Avasare, Sanso de Nelakala Tibeno, Meanua, Evani, Vivaha Mangaloho, Venat Utsa, Pathana Shala Tula Asana Sankia, Pansi at a Vadinam, Pamanak, Uperime, Ekasi Panas de Nakuta Sahabag Vimatat. Uh, Evani Shala Vala Asana Sankhya Vala Pansiyata Adunam Uparimaya Siya Denukuta Pamanak Seema Kiri Mata Memanavita Thirneka Latibeno Eva Gema Avamangala Kattutu Sandaha Ekvarakata Visipas Denukuta Pamanak Sahabag Vimata Avasar Labinathara Visheshem Raja Seva Keyan Rakiya Vata Genva Ganyimidhi Ema Ayatana Vala Pradhani Inta Avasha Sudhu Suparidi, Rakia Vata, Genva Ganimata, Upadis Labadi Ratibeno. Mevan Evita, Rajusava, Pavatim Sandaha, Sangidane Kalatibeno Suluma Rajusava, September Masse, Palavani Dakwa, Halde Mimata, Mevan Evita, Thirne Kalatibeno. In the meantime, the Secretary of the Ministry of Public Services released an amended circular outlining mechanisms for state sector staff attendance. Accordingly, state sector employees will only be required to report to work on three days of the week requiring the formation of staff teams on a rotation basis. The circular also loves expectant mothers and mothers with children under the age of one employed in the state sector to work from home. For further information on the new guidelines, visit our website www.adadarana.lk. President Gotabe Rajapaksa today directed health officials to administer the first dose of Sinopharm at any and all vaccine centers that are administering the second doses. In the meantime, the country received another batch of 2 million Sinopharm vaccines today, which would be deployed as second doses. Sri Lanka's vaccine drive was further boosted today after another consignment of 2 million Sinopharm doses touched down at the Bandaranaik International Airport. State Minister of Production, Supply and Regulation of Pharmaceuticals, Professor Channa Jayasumana, says that the new batch of vaccines would be rolled out as second doses. Meanwhile, President Gotabe Rajapaksa directed health authorities to make arrangements to administer first doses of the Sinopharm vaccine to those aged 30 years and above at any vaccine centre administering the second dose today. 
This is in line with achieving the target of vaccinating all over 30s by the end of September with at least one vaccine dose. In the meantime, with information on vaccine centre locations among members of the public law, Dr. Hemanta Herat urged people to contact their local medical officers of health to find out where they can get their shots. He added that the Ministry of Health is unaware of all locations of vaccine centres as the local MOH officers are responsible for deciding where the vaccines will be administered. Meanwhile, Police Media Spokesperson Senior DIG Ajit Rohan has stated that the second doses of the Covishield vaccine will be rolled out at the Police Field Office headquarters in Colombo 4 for those awaiting to receive a second dose. He stated that vaccine recipients are also required to bring their national identity cards and the vaccination cards to the vaccine centre. In other developments, yesterday a total of 184,695 vaccine doses were rolled out. 31,323 people were immunized with the first dose of the Covishield vaccine, while 26,067 were given its second dose. Further, the first dose of the Sinopharm was administered to 79,182 people yesterday, along with 6,878 second doses as well. Meanwhile, 13 doses of the second Sputnik vaccine, 41,156 Pfizer first doses, and 76 Moderna jabs were also rolled out yesterday. More news on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. Big three. Welcome back in more news. Accusations were hurled at the government and parliament today on the country's pandemic situation and the handling of law and order. Ilangi Tamilar Sukachi parliamentarian Imme Sumandiran held the government responsible for the rampant spread of the novel coronavirus in the country, which is threatening to overwhelm the country's health system. The parliamentarian also kicked off a heated exchange of words with the Minister of Public Security over the country's law and order situation. There are accusations being made across the aisle on how effectively or otherwise the government has been dealing with this issue. Health authorities have repeatedly in the last few days told the country effectively not to hold them responsible for the decisions that are being taken. They are saying that their advice is not being heeded. The hospital's situation is pathetic to say the least. The situation is worsening by the hour and in such a situation we are relaxing rules with regard to movement this virus doesn't move by itself it is carried by humans so permitting free movement at a time like this is a sure recipe to have a disaster when we had one or two persons tested in April last year, we closed down the country. But when near 100 are dying every day, we are removing these restrictions. Even these restrictions are not being imposed legally. So there is a huge problem with regard to that. Quarantine law only permits quarantine. We are still unable to do that one thing that this house is empowered to do in fighting this issue. We are not doing that because the government or those who are actually wielding power want to keep that power in their own hands and exercise it on an ad hoc basis. The Ilangi Tamilar Sikachi parliamentarian also accused the government of further complicating an already precarious pandemic situation by its ineffective handling of the law and order situation in the country. There is no rule of law. Persons being abducted by the police, not in uniform. It only shows a thorough breakdown of the law and order situation in this country. I don't know why we even have a minister called a public security minister. When senior lecturers, student leaders are abducted in broad daylight, by police personnel in civvies. Why do they have to come in civvies? Why do they have to come in white vans? You are reminding the white van culture. You want to instill fear in the people's mind. And that is why you are doing this. Somebody else will do this tomorrow. And we won't know whether it is the police or someone else. There will be abductions for ransom. Honorable uh, Sumandiran is talking nonsense. You mentioned my name. You criticize me. You have the brass to call my speech uh, nonsense. Who are you? Absolute havoc you are reaking in the country. And you have the you are the brass to stand up here and try to answer me. Sit down, please. If the word nonsense is to attach to anything, that is to the honorable minister, not to my 
speech, all I am saying is that the teachers today are demonstrating on very justifiable ground. They have come out in protest against the Kotalawala Defence University bill and we saw how they were arrested, produced before the magistrate who enlarged them on bail and at the gate of the magistrate court they were bundled into a jeep by this minister's goons and taken to Mullativu. What kind of justice is that? And therefore the teachers came out in protest. The BC Pereira report has recommended how anomalies with regard to teachers and principals salary is to be resolved. That must be implemented. That is all that the teachers are asking. Garu Sumantiran Mantri Tuma Nitya Sama Teka Dekhi Lai Hua. Why then Apeena Mata Kaya Yara Dushana Maradana Kamitu Etu Ma Thiti Yara Nitya Sama Aji Ke. Mahita Ne Ewa Ke Pujjal Yoh Nitya Kriya Adma Karan Adha Ana Nitya Sama Teka Dekhi Lai Hua. Api Nitya Kriya Adma Karan Ne Anna Ape Andu Ape Tuma Na Tawai Valvedu Nitya Kriya Adma Karan Karan Arliya Kala Mandri Eta Gana. Mewa Ke Nitya Virodhi Dushana Maradana Kamitu Hada Agana Tidas Bahad Pahalava Kale Ape Vada Karavu Amati Varu Garu Agda Ama Atya Tuma Ake Daruan Me Atta Nang Ota Ganna Pimburu Bath Thadu Ake Kama Ra Eta Gana Ek Kama Ra Eta Gana Hita Pu Minis Su Adha Veeduru Gewa La Eta Gala Gana Meanwhile, Samagi Janabalavege parliamentarian Mayanta Desanayaka called for greater unity between the government and the opposition as the country stands at a crucial juncture in its effort at controlling the pandemic and dealing with its other challenges as well. We have to get together. We have to come together as a country and change the situation. If not, everything in Sri Lanka will fail and our children and our children's children will pay the price for the failures of this government. And as members of parliament, we have failed the next generation. Therefore, I urge the government, let us work together. This is a crucial juncture in our history. The future will be determined on what course of action that we as politicians and leaders of this country take. Recent arrests of student activists as well as educators engaged in demonstrations are making headlines due to the arrests being carried out by police personnel in civvies. The arrests were subjected to criticism in parliament today with the opposition stating that this could lead to abductions by underworld figures and other parties for ransom purposes. Five student activists, including the convener of the Inter-University Students' Federation, Vasantha Mudalige, and president of the Sri Jayavardhanapura University Students' Union, Amila Sandeepa, were arrested by the police yesterday. <laughs> According to police media spokesperson, senior DIG Ajit Rohana, the duo were arrested on charges of damaging public property while protesting against the Kotalawala Defence University Bill near Parliament, as well as injuring the OIC of the Maharagama police during the demonstration. Placed in the custody of the Thalangama police, the suspects were produced before the Kaduvela magistrate this afternoon, after which they were remanded until the 11th of this month. The police then took measures to place the suspects in quarantine in order to prevent any spread of COVID-19. Meanwhile, several videos of police arrests currently circulating on social media have become a hot political topic. The videos show police officers in civvies arresting suspects who violated quarantine laws during demonstrations. The matter was also taken up in Parliament today to which Minister of Public Security Saratvira Sekara responded. Meanwhile, Meanwhile, despite constant warnings over the severity of the country's pandemic situation, the day did not go by without demonstrations. Protests were seen staged in Colombo today calling for the binning of the Kotalawala Defence University Bill. In the meantime, demonstrations were also worked off across the island today over pay issues faced by teachers and principals. Police investigators have submitted a report on the analysis of CCTV footage from MP Rishad Badiuddin's residence to the Women and Children's Bureau. Meanwhile, investigations are continuing to determine who bears the responsibility for the death of 16-year-old 16 16-year-old 16 Ishalini, who succumbed to burn injuries after an alleged self-immolation. Police media spokesman senior DIG Ajit Rohana has stated that MP Richard Badiuddin's spouse and father-in-law bear responsibility for the death of 16-year-old domestic Ishalini, who was employed at the MP's residence. The former minister, who is currently in CID custody, was set to record a statement on the matter today. 
Meanwhile, the police video analysis team that inspected footage from CCTV camera systems at MP Badiuddin's residence have submitted a report to the Police Women and Children's Bureau. Police investigators have revealed that on the day of the tragic incident, a number of CCTV cameras installed at the MP's house were not in operation. They also revealed that from CCTV footage, it was shown that the residents had, during the incident when the 16-year-old was on fire, were seen to instruct the victim to jump into a pond located at the residence to douse the flames. U.S. Ambassador Elena B. Teplitz says that U.S. firms may be wary of investing with any port city entity that may come under U.S. government sanctions. Speaking to Indivariya Muwatta on our current affairs program at Hyde Park on Adha 24 yesterday, the U.S. envoy added that Sri Lanka needs to ensure a healthy investment environment that offers a corruption-free climate to attract true foreign direct investments. Addressing the U.S. administration's concerns on the Port City Economic Commission bill that was passed in Parliament last May, U.S. Ambassador to Sri Lanka Elena B. Teplitz stated yesterday that despite a lot of interest by U.S. investors, they may think twice about partnering with entities that may be sanctioned by the U.S. Treasury and State Departments. Uh, you recently said that the contents of the Port City Act leave room for bribery or corruption within this economic area. What reasons do you give here, Ambassador? Aware of the aspirations of the government in terms of what it can deliver economically. And, and I think, you know, if that's the goal of trying to attract foreign investment, it's really crucial to have the best possible environment, one that meets the highest international financial standards. We still have concerns that there may be doors that open to bad practices, essentially, money laundering or corrupt practices, other things. And so it's going to be very important to ensure that the governance and the regulatory regimes that govern the port city are really solid and really conform to those international norms because international investors aren't going to take a risk in an environment that could expose them to practices that they don't participate in or are illegal for them to participate in. What do you hear from U.S. investors? So U.S. investors, you know, writ large, are interested in Sri Lanka. We discussed a little bit the ease of doing business and some of the barriers that are there and what it will take for Sri Lanka to be best positioned to attract the kinds of reputable firms that can really improve economic development here. You know, I think Port City kind of falls into that. Companies are going to want to know what that investment regime looks like, that again, they're not going to be exposed to risks that could present problems for them, either from regulatory bodies, shareholders, and boards of directors. And they have to know also that they're not going to be exposed or collaborating with entities that could have me economic measures levied against them, whereby U.S. Treasury or Commerce Department. Meanwhile, in response to questions on how willing the U.S. is to aid the Sri Lankan government in dealing with pro-LTTE and diaspora groups engaged in overseas fundraising. The U.S. envoy said that although the terrorist outfit still remains a banned group in the U.S., Sri Lanka still needs to approach the issue by addressing the legitimate political issues that exist. But will the United States also be willing to engage with the government and address the issue of pro-LTTE groups as well as diaspora raising funds and propagating this cause overseas? So the United States continues to list the LTTE as a terrorist organization and I think that kind of says a lot about where we stand on that. I know there are many groups abroad of people of Sri Lankan origin and you know they have political views mm -hmm. that run the whole spectrum um, so I'm certainly not willing to say all diaspora groups have yes. an LTT link. The United States was never supportive of the LTT and collaborated with the government here to mm -hmm. defeat it but I think there are some genuine political issues that are out there that have to be addressed and that's going to make for durable and lasting peace and prosperity for Sri Lanka going forward. Further, on the question of U.S. concerns on the Prevention of Terrorism Act, the U.S. envoy says that Sri Lanka needs to understand that there remains no place in this day and age for indefinite detentions and that the government's keenness to revise the act must translate into delivering an efficient system of justice to the people. You've on many occasions raised issues with regard to the Prevention of Terrorism Act and have called for its review. How do you look back at your engagements and Sri Lanka's willingness to progress in these concerns raised? The government has committed to reviewing the Prevention of Terrorism Act, amending it or repealing it, but basically finding a solution to bring the, the provisions of the act to meet international standards. I think it's essential. Sri Lanka, again, is a democratic state and having an obligation to deliver justice to its citizens 
has to address mm -hmm. a law that essentially allows for indefinite detention and does not provide for due process. In the modern day, we kind of look at this and say, we know we owe more mm -hmm. to people um, and having a, a swift and a definite justice process yeah. is really going to be very important. Welcome back in business news. Sri Lankan stocks gained 1.09% today as the Colombo All Share Price Index gained 87.18 points to close at 8,099.12. The S&P SL20 Index of more liquid stocks gained 18.41 points to close at 3,056.02. Now here's Zimantha Matthew with the stock update for today. Today we saw again the market going into the grain despite two days of setback where the market was in a rate. Yesterday we saw a huge decline in the market by around 200 points. But though we thought the trend is likely to continue, today we saw reversal. So at the start of the day there was a bit of a volatility in the index and investors were also of two mindsets whether to go in big or not. But gradually we saw buying interest emerging in the market and then we saw the market significantly moving into the green and accelerating in the green as well. So strong earnings is one of the main reasons for the index upsurge. We saw number of counters releasing very strong results especially in the textile sector where we saw both TJL and MGT recording very strong results. In international news, 76 years ago today, one of the world's most devastating acts of war was perpetrated against a civilian populace by the dropping of a nuclear bomb on the people of Hiroshima in Japan in 1945. Accordingly, the annual commemoration memorial was held in the city today to remember the more than 140,000 people who perished in the attack. With that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanella Fernando. Have a good night.